like to welcome you all to our services today and hope that you had a great Christmas and are looking forward to a great new year, probably this year more than any other. And we want to be able to begin our time here by offering our praise to God, singing to him of his amazing grace. So wherever you happen to be, join with us and let's offer this praise to God. so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless and on wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. Son and daughter, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. to take communion after this next song. We're preparing to come before Jesus and to be confronted by the incredible depths of his love and a love that was revealed completely in sacrifice and sacrifice on a cross. So as we prepare to receive that, offer this in praise to him, knowing that nothing can stand against the love of Jesus. This is called No Weapon.
Nothing can separate my heart from you Cause there's no weapon stronger than your love There's no weapon stronger than your love No height, no depth can overcome Cause there's no weapon stronger than Say that faith can make the mountains move, and nothing is impossible for you. I fear no evil, for I know the truth. Nothing can separate my heart from you, cause there's no weapon stronger than. Father, we are so grateful to be able to come before you, thanking you for all that you've given to us in your love. Jesus, we're grateful that you have come and chosen to reveal your love to us, not in a way that uh, the world shows its own power and its own strength, but you showed your love in a, in a way of sacrifice and sacrifice on a cross. And we come taking communion, remembering that today and asking that you would not only make us grateful for that, but that you would challenge us to examine um, our own hearts and our own attitudes, and that, God, we would learn what it is to come before you and to offer love and sacrifice as well to you, to others, in the model of your Son, Jesus. And so we're grateful for that, and take this communion in Jesus' name. Amen.
we've come to the time for our offering, so if you would bow with me, we'll pray as we go to that time. Father, we are so grateful for all that you have given to us. And even in the midst of the end of this incredible year, we can still look and count the incredible blessings that you have offered to us. Your faithfulness continues to remain. Your love for us continues to remain, and we are grateful for that. And so, God, we come and express this gratitude uh, in so many ways, but in this moment, we express it in our offering. Uh, God, we come and we give that to you, knowing that in your hands, you will do great things as you continue to work in the midst of your kingdom here. We're grateful for that, and we give to you faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. And as always, you can give in the multiple ways that we are collecting here, whether it's online or text to give or by mailing it directly here. Uh, that information is there for you on the screen. Couple announcements to make sure that you're aware of. Uh, we are still meeting outdoors on Sunday mornings at 9 and at 10.15, and we welcome you to come and join us for those gatherings. They are uh, distanced, uh, wearing masks so that uh, we're safe and, and able to continue to worship God together. I also wanted to let you know that the Advent boxes for Feed My Sheep that we have been collecting, we encourage you to finish those up and bring those here. Uh, you can bring them uh, to the office on Sunday um, or that very first Monday in January. Uh, we're going to be giving them away that first Monday in January in the evening in our Feed My Sheep program. So you can bring them by uh, to the church that first Sunday in January or that first Monday so that we're able to hand those out to our families. If you have any questions about out, uh, those Feed My Sheep Advent boxes, you can contact us. There's information there um, that gives you what it is that's being collected in those boxes. Uh, last thing that I want to make sure you're aware of is our Year for Jesus. We've been announcing this uh, for the last few weeks. This is an incredible opportunity to commit uh, in throughout the year of 2021 to be on your own every single week throughout the year. I'll be receiving a devotion that allows you to spend time in one of the stories in the life of Jesus. To use that as an opportunity to enter into a time of silence and prayer and connection with Jesus. And as you come here to the church uh, at any time, we have these uh, notebooks that are available. This will be a place for you to keep those devotions throughout the year as you continue to grow in that time that you spend with Jesus throughout the entire uh, throughout the entire year. Information is available. You'll see it on the email that uh, that came with this link for our services. Make sure that you click on that. You can sign up for a year with Jesus there. You can also see the larger information sheet that will give you everything that you need to know. That's it, and we look forward to seeing you again at our services. Hello, everybody. I hope you had a great Christmas. I know it's so different this year, but still a time to celebrate the birth of our Savior. You know, last week we looked at Mary's song and the emphasis of servanthood and the greatness of God that she demonstrated in that song. Today, we're going to talk about someone who is also able to put into words what was in his heart. And this guy's name is Simeon. And I want us to see some attributes of Simeon that allowed him really to share a song of joy. And so as we close out this really crazy year of 2020, I want us to see some hallmarks of joy. And we see them here in Simeon's song. The first one is this, joy wholeheartedly follows the Lord. We pick it up in Luke chapter 2, verse 25. There was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. I want to stop right there for a second because that's the description that we have of him. One cause of joy, a great cause of joy in our life, is being righteous and devout. Really meaning being an obedient follower of Jesus. Simon here is a, a righteous and a devout man. He's a man of joy in this story because he faithfully followed the Lord all of his life. Now, the word righteous or righteousness in Scripture could be defined as this, keeping covenant between God and us. And Simeon has lived his life keeping that covenant. In other words, the God has promised him things. Simeon has promised him his life, and he has lived the way that he has been called to live. And a lesson in all this is if we want God to use us, if we want God to choose us, if you want God to do something in and through you, then it begins by wholeheartedly following him. And that in turn leads to joy. 
Here's another lesson. Joy patiently waits on the Lord. We pick it up in verse 25 of Luke 2. He, Simeon, was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Simeon had been waiting. Uh, he, he's an old man at this point in the story. He's been waiting for decades. Uh, you think about it, the Jewish people had been waiting for centuries and centuries. And they were waiting for the Messiah to come. None of us like waiting rooms. They're never fun. But here is Simeon. He waited. He waited patiently. He was waiting on God. And I think there's a lesson on joy for us here. Joy comes through patience. Perhaps maybe more than that, joy comes through anticipation. You know, for Simeon, catching a glimpse of the Messiah is a fulfillment of anticipation. He'd been waiting for this gift for years and years. He'd been on the lookout for it. He'd been, you know, checking underneath the Christmas tree to see if it had come yet. He was just always looking. You got to wonder if Simeon's senses kind of heightened every time he saw a parent walk into the temple with a baby wrapped in a blue blanket, thinking maybe this is the one. Maybe this is the Messiah. You know, one of the reasons why we enjoy Christmas, we enjoy the month of December, is because of the anticipation of Christmas. Half of wanting is waiting. You know, and I, and I wonder if one of the best parts of Christmas for Simeon was the anticipation. Now, it's not always the easiest, right? It's not always the part that's the most enjoyable. You wish things could come sooner. Yet the longer you wait, the more it increases your joy. You know, what gift do you enjoy more? Uh, the one that you pick up on a whim or the one that you plot and save for for months and think about in advance? Simeon had patiently waited for a very long time, and he trusted in God. He trusted God's word. He trusted God's timetable, and it brought him joy. Here's another thing we see here. Joy genuinely praises the Lord. So Mary and Joseph bring Jesus, their son, to the temple courts, and he's 40 days old at this point. And in a sense, this is kind of like a family dedication service as the parents dedicate their child to God on this day. Simeon is drawn by the Spirit on this day to be in the temple courts at that exact moment and at that exact location. Luke 2, 27, moved by the Spirit. He went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Man, what an incredible moment this was. He, he takes the baby in his arms and he immediately begins to praise God. God, sovereign Lord. And he refers to the past and the present and the future. He says, now you can call me home, Lord. I'm ready to die. Dismiss your servant because you have allowed me to see and to hold your son, the Messiah, salvation. Man, I wonder what Simeon thought when he asked, what's the baby's name? And, and they look at Simeon and they said, well... The angel told us to call him Jesus. Of course, Jesus means the one who saves. I wonder what Simeon thought when he heard that. I mean, th th this had become the talk of the town. This had become the, the talk of the temple. You know, a lesson in this for us is, is true and complete joy is found when God is praised. You know, we, we can be patient, we can anticipate, we can be righteous, but if, if we fail to give praise to God, for His actions, for His blessings, for His working in our lives, for Him seeing us through even the darkest of times and the most difficult of years. We're missing then, if we forget to give Him praise, we're missing out on the true joy we can have. And, and since the Lord is the source of all joy, one of the ways to keep that joy flowing into our lives is through praising the one who gives us joy, the one who's the author of joy. Joy also confidently trusts in the Lord's plan. There, there's a confident trust that's rooted there. 
And Simeon understood this. I mean, he waited for God's timing, and then it unfolded. You know, what are some of the things that rob us of our joy? One is time, you know. We wait for a long time to have something come, and it doesn't come to pass, you know. Maybe it's a raise. Maybe it's a, a spouse. Maybe it's an end of a pandemic. Might be a, you know, something else in our lives. But, but the longer we wait and it doesn't come to fruition, our joy begins to fade. That wasn't the case for Simeon. The anticipation for him built as he knew that as God's servant, he would not be dismissed. He was not going to go into heaven until he had seen the Messiah. But time, you know, can, can rob our joy if we're not careful. Mistakes can rob our joy. Sometimes our mistakes can frustrate us. Sometimes our, our failures can cause us to get bogged down and we fixate on our past rather than preparing for the future. You know, we got to remember we are forgiven. We all make mistakes. We shouldn't take ourselves too seriously. We got to move on. We learn from things and we don't dwell on those things. Circumstances can steal our joy. I mean, when things around us aren't going the way that we wanted them to, uh, well, suddenly that can steal our joy, you know. Life deals us an unexpected blow. The, the year's not what we expect it to be. I had to quarantine most of the time. And yet you know in your heart of hearts, God is still good. And, 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 you, and you find yourselves in a season like this, a difficult season with circumstances as you find yourself, and you got to tell yourself, listen, God is still on his throne. He still cares. He still loves. He still knows you. Maybe this is a season of preparation for the next. You know, you think about Joseph in the Old Testament who was in prison. Then one day through God-ordained change of events, he becomes, you know, second in command of all of the palace. Think of Paul chained to a Roman guard in a jail cell. And he writes these words in Philippians chapter 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. I say again, rejoice. From a dark prison cell with a smile on his face, he says this, I have learned to be content in whatever my circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Through Jesus. His secret of having joy was his personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, time can rob our joy, mistakes, circumstances, tragedy can re, uh, rob us of joy. You know, at the closing part of the Christmas story, a part that we tend to skip over because it's so brutal, I mean, it doesn't really fit nicely with Silent Night, you know, it doesn't fit with angels singing, it doesn't fit with nativity scenes with golden frankincense and myrrh. It's, uh, it involves King Herod and the wise men and you know, King Herod says to them, uh, he gives them a, his lie. He says, go find this baby and come back and tell me where he is so that where he is, I can go and worship him. It was an all a lie because, you know, Herod was arrogant. He was egotistical. He had no desire to worship this baby at all. His goal is to wipe out any of the competition, regardless of how young or innocent they might be. Well, the, the wise men find Jesus and uh, Matthew chapter 2 verse 12 says of the wise men having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod they returned to their country by another route but it's not over angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream tells him to leave right there and then in the middle of the night take your family head to Egypt okay this is the long way saying because Herod is searching for the child and he wants to kill him and so Mary and Joseph they take Jesus they rush out they grab their belongings they 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 head to Egypt you know, Herod had been waiting months and months for the Magi to return. And finally, one day he realizes, okay, I guess they're not coming back. And suddenly he understands what has taken place. And in verse 16 of Matthew 2, it says, When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. He gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. This, this man is so brutal. He says to kill any male child up to the age of two. He's not taking any chances on a baby that might be bigger than that age. So he extends the net to include this wider swath of children. In a matter of hours, his despicable deed is carried out by his brutal, obedient soldiers. Based on the population of Bethlehem at the time, probably been maybe 20 baby boys were slaughtered. How horrible. The Bible tells us in verse 17 in Matthew 2, after these babies are slaughtered, then that what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. 
A voice is heard in Rama, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. I mean, this is a prophecy of, uh, written by Jeremiah hundreds of years before it came to happen. Now, what's kind of telling, you know, is that Matthew is the only place that this horrendous act is recorded for us. And, and, and maybe the only reason that it was recorded here is so we would know. But, but violence and, and, and violence against innocent people and, and suffering people, that was commonplace at the time. So it really wasn't that big of news, as, as horrifying as this. That is the world that Jesus came into. Jesus was born into a dark and impoverished world, and his survival was surrounded by violence. And so, I mean, this real Christmas story, as it ends, is, is pretty rough. So is life in this world. Well, back to the story in Luke 2. Things are about to change quickly as Simeon approaches this very last verse of the song. And it takes an unexpected turn, almost, by way of some dismal foreshadowing. And, and, and it tells us here that, that Mary and Joseph, I mean, as they heard Simeon here, they were marveling at what he was saying. They were all smiles. They were overjoyed at the validation that their son was the Messiah and all of the good that he was going to do. But then right then, under the leading of the Holy Spirit, Simeon addresses Mary, mother of Jesus, in verse 34. It says, Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, so he's going to call her out individually, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And then he says this, and a sword will pierce your soul too. Wow, what a, what a strange thing to say at a baby dedication, specifically to this mother. A sword will pierce your own soul too. Mary, this is going to be a test for you. Is she going to be able to do this? Can she accept the way God's plan unfolds, serving this role as mom to, this, to the Messiah? Can she trust God in the midst of tragedy? Can she think long term, not just short term? Can she think eternal, not just temporal? Can she think about all of humankind and not just of the baby that she has born? Simeon is looking at her and he's saying, this is not going to be easy. And here we have this old man who's ready to be taken to heaven, this aged saint. And he's preparing Mary to realize, you know, you can be joyful. You can still be joyful, Mary, even in the midst of suffering. But I want you to know a sword will pierce your soul too. I'm certain these were not words she was expecting to hear. But then 33 years later, no doubt Mary's mind would have gone back to Simeon's statement as she watches her son, the son of man, suspended between heaven and earth. And she watches the most horrendous death happen to the one that she loves more than life itself. And after he would breathed his last, she watches a Roman soldier thrust a spear into her son's side to make sure he's dead. From Mary's perspective, it might as well have been in her own side. For only a mother can truly relate to understanding that. And when Mary stood at Calvary, I, I don't know what she thought, I don't know what she did, but I had to think she mumbled under her breath and they put that spear into his side and she was thinking, sorry Jesus, I wish it were me, I wish it were me. That's what moms do. Throughout this prophetic song, Simeon has been a man of joy, telling a story of joy, but he's saying it's not always going to be a happy story. The irony is that the very thing that seems to take the utter happiness out of this moment for Mary and Joseph is the very thing that would one day give entire, the entire world hope, and that is the cross of Christ. And so we're encouraged, as the Hebrew writer says, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, perfecter, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider Jesus, what he endured, so that you don't lose heart. The joy set before him, it was us. He had everything else. He had the Father. He had glory. He had a crown. He had the authority of the entire universe. He had the angels bowing to him. The only thing he didn't have was us. 
And if he loved you like that, and if he loved you, and you gave him, and, he, and you were his joy, can we become his joy? And can we let that joy flow out of our lives and into the lives of others? Father, we thank you for Simeon. Thank you for this story. This story that is filled with joy. Jesus brings joy to this world, joy to the world the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. And joy is not the same as happiness. It wasn't happy when he was put on a cross. Mary wasn't happy when she heard this news from Simeon. But the joy endures because Jesus is the hope of the world. And we put our hope in him that his joy might be made complete in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless all of you and have a great New Year.